Yo. Mom, get the camera. Get the camera, mom. I cast a CSGO major grand final. Get the goddamn camera. I'm back, boys. Back in Montreal. Uh, it's been a week since Paris wrapped up. I took an extra four days in Europe on my own dime. Uh, Sophie and I went to London directly after Paris to just kind of decompress. I didn't want to come right back to the apartment. I felt like I felt like I was going to need some more time out there, you know, in the wilderness of EU. And uh, I was right. We had a really good time. Tried my best to just kind of get off the radar and just soak up the moment. Uh, but we'll get to that. We got we got quite a bit to talk about today. Uh, another episode of the Scrawn Dog in. First, first and foremost, I have to say, uh, if you are one of the few people who in Paris, when we met, mentioned Scrawn Dog in. <laughs> God damn. <sighs> Brought it fucking tear to my eye um it's it's really cool to know and to meet people that are are out there are out there listening each and every time you know because i talk to the void i know i know there's people listening but now to put you know faces to the audience was really cool so uh thank you for that and and uh well, i hope you keep enjoying so paris huh i keep i keep trying to like reflect back to the start of the event because I'm sure there's stuff that at the very beginning I want to talk about but you know it get it gets all like mixed mixed up together and honestly the end of the event was just so good <laughs> like how, how am I supposed to talk about challenger stage man we did a final <laughs> we did a fucking grand final uh, I don't want to talk about challenger stage but uh, I will I will start off by talking about Paris as a city. And then we'll get into the Counter Strike and my thoughts on the Blast event, and of course, the last few days, um, and kind of my my mentality ever since. So that's today's itinerary. It's bright and early in Montreal right now, nine ten a.m. Having my morning coffee, looking out the window to what's going to be another sunny day. Uh, one of the nice things about leaving in the spring for a prolonged period of time is like when I left all the trees outside my apartment were still all scraggly looking you know they didn't have leaves they hadn't bloomed the grass was still kind of yellowish you know we get seasons over here in Montreal real seasons but you take three weeks three weeks away from home and uh next thing you know it is lush so I've come home to a very beautiful landscape uh, great weather as well which was kind of hit or miss when we were in Paris. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Feels good, man. But to Paris. To Paris, I say, you got a bad reputation. At least my thoughts going into Paris. I felt like anybody I talked to from Europe who... Anytime, you know, we were discussing like, yeah, Blast Paris Major, like, oh, we get to go to Paris, you know, we're usually we're very excited for for venues, you know, like when we were going to the Rio Major, everybody was stoked. Oh, beaches, man. Great fruit, man. Well, everybody was just so negative about Paris. At least that's how I know. That's my perception. You know, like, oh, Paris uh, stinks. Uh, French people. Yo, Paris is dope. Paris is a world-class city, all right? So if you're one of those people who has maybe not spent time in Paris, but y'all want to talk that shit, get out of there. <clears throat> Fuck, my voice isn't warmed up yet. Can't do the high notes, boys. We'll be, we'll be down here in the lows for the first 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, Paris is awesome. And there's a few reasons why I enjoy Paris so much. I think one of them is pretty, uh, you know, it's low key, but this is this is something that that I always appreciate in city landscapes is uh, greenery. So Paris is really cool because it feels like there's an, there's, it almost feels like it's overgrown. You know, now I don't know if I if this applies to all areas of Paris, um, 
when I went down to you know, the center towards Louvre and, uh, you know, the center of the city, definitely you've got your designated parks, which are very green, but then outside of that, it's really just people's balconies. So two things. One, the, there's like the, the grass and the shrubs on the streets, you know, like you're walking down the sidewalk and there's like trees every once in a while. And then the grass around those trees. Well, at least here in NA, and I would say like in most, most cities, that grass just gets chopped, you know, it's like overly maintained. Like I know grass and weeds are a nuisance and it's probably not good for the pavement, etc. But in Paris, a lot of those, like a lot of those little shrubs and, and grassy areas, the grass is just never cut. So it's all overgrown and it's all just, it just makes for more greenery. And I like that. I like seeing grass and plants and trees and flowers you know I'm all about that uh it calms me down green is my favorite color puts me in a certain mood I don't know it's just it's nice to see so Paris had a lot of that like vines you know vines growing over walls and it just doesn't yeah I brought this up to one of our French talent managers shout out Nicholas fantastic help throughout the whole event um, I brought it up to Nicholas. I was like, dude, this is a beautiful city. You guys have so much greenery. And he's like, yeah, there's just, it's cause there's no money to pay people to cut it. And I thought, damn, that's a real problem. But at the same time, it's a problem. I'll let slide. So visually Paris was really nice. Felt like there was a bunch of nature and, uh, where we were staying at in, uh, Bercy, Bercy, um, there was even more of it. You know, we had a park that was like five minute walk from our, uh, from our hotel. Anytime you wanted to like go hit the, uh, the, the underground Metro, there was, uh, you know, you could always walk through the park on the way to, on the way to the, the, the patasserie, le boulangerie. So, sorry guys. This is going to be a re reoccurring theme. All, all episode, by the way, uh, we're working on our French. Okay. All aboard. Uh, when we'd go grab croissants and coffees, it was always like a nice walk through the park you could take. You could take the cobblestone road next to it. But me, I'm going to walk through the park if it's an option. So Paris, very beautiful visually. Um, the people, very beautiful visually. Uh, cool styles in Paris. You know, I think that's uh, not to judge strangers, but when you're walking in a city that has just a very fashionable population, uh, it's just nice. You know, it's it's nice on the eyes. Um Paris men and women y'all nice on the eyes R reminded me a little bit of Montreal I think that there's a, a bit of French influence here for sure and some of like the like like the styles of clothing where people wear lots of layers and and uh, but but definitely I would say one thing I noticed in Paris is a lot less like alternative looking people um, not a lot of like dyed hair not a lot of punks not a lot of rapscallions and riffraff you know, everybody's pretty clean cut, sporty. It's kind of like, it's like a Denmark, but with more, more of a fashion flair. And honestly, very clean, very clean city. I never saw, I mean, I guess, you know, during the whole, during the, the, the protests when the sanitation workers were striking. Yeah, I saw pictures of like garbage piling up. And maybe that's why expectations for Paris were, were so low. It was just because with the protests and like all the news cycle ahead of time, it was making it seem like a fucking war zone. And, uh, you know, shout out to the French. Um, Y'all fight for your well-being and the well-being of your society. And you don't take shit from the government. And you do it in a very organized way as well, right? Like you have you have organized protests, certain days of protests, and and not, never was our experience in Paris hindered whatsoever, right? And I know that was like such a talking point going into the event. Um, so, yeah, great city, great people, um, the food. Oh my god, bro, the food was to die for, straight up. Uh, had some excellent meals in Paris. And I would say, like, excellent meals in all walks of life, you know. Um, first of all, have to fucking have to identify the creperies. So just being able to, you know, like, street food in any good city. Street food in any city makes it a great city. 
If at any point I'm walking down the road and I'm like, shit, before we go do this, I need just a bite to eat. Or, ah, man, before we get back to the hotel, like I just need, you know, that one last little something, something to uh, pack away the evening. Paris was perfect for that. Crepes are amazing for that reason. And, you know, it, for where I'm at, crepes are a little bit different. You know, I know American pancakes be them thick boys. And here in French Canada, our crepes are definitely thinner, but not quite as thin as the Parisian crepe. Damn. That shit's like paper thin, folded 20 times. Uh, I definitely, you know, I tried the spectrum of crepes. You hit up the Nutella banana to start. That's a classic. Then you get the raspberry almond chantilly. And then, you know, the, on the savory end, I think my favorite, so my favorite crepe was this one. Uh, me, Launders, and Maui were out one night on the town during Challenger stage getting a little zip zip. And, uh, you know, a few wine bars later, if you catch my drift. We wanted something to eat before we go back, and we show up at the creperie, just like randomly walked walked into this place. Not even walked into it, right? It's like a street stall. It's just a door facing the sidewalk, and uh, started chatting up the guy. The guy in front of us, at first I'd ordered three, you know, banana crepes. Then I saw this guy putting his masterpiece together, and this dude looked like he was straight out of the Matrix. You know, tall gentleman. Short cornrows, round black glasses, all black outfit. You know, he was a pretty pretty cool looking guy. And he had no time for us. You know, he didn't he didn't make eye contact. He didn't want to talk to us. He didn't look at us. So as we're chatting up the uh, the guy making the crepes, nice gentleman. Um, this guy just looks over at us as he's whipping up his last bits of the crepe, and he just tells me, "Yay." This is the best crepe. And he lists off what's inside it. So this is the best crepe. I can confirm uh, this is the best crepe. So it's super thin crepe, cracked egg. Egg gets smeared all over, just as thin as the crepe. Then you get shredded white chicken. Then you get a mental cheese. All over that bad boy. So much cheese, right? Dripping in it. So, shredded white chicken meat, a mental cheese, samurai sauce, which is a har- harissa, harissa-based hot sauce. I hope I'm saying that right. And Tabasco. So, two hot sauces, chicken, cheese, and egg. Mm. God damn. I had two of them. One with uh, One on my own. The other guys kept to their original orders. And then one time with Launders as well. He tried it. At a different crepery spot a few days later. And it was to die for. So crepes, big up. And that's what I'm saying. Like even your, you know, that's just like basic street food. And that's fantastic in Paris. Then your your Uber Eats options, excellent in Paris. Um, just the quality of food across the city is just great. And I love that. You know, I love, I love good food. So shout out, shout out to the French again. Uh, we did a couple of really nice dinners as well. Took Moses out for uh, a little dining experience with Maui Snake. If you've never gone on a dining experience with Maui Snake, it is, it's an experience. You know, uh, I never really talked about my meals and my my dishes before I sat down for a proper dinner with Maui, and uh, I think he, you know, he's he's he, I've caught a bug by doing so. Um, discussing your dinners while you have them, if if they are really that special of a supper is a very fun thing to do. And we took Moses out for that and, uh, hit up a place called, I think Moco Loco. Nice set meal, super fresh ingredients, some cool fusion stuff going on. Um, and all in all, every time great wine, God, the, just great wine. I don't think I've ever drank as much wine in my life as I did in the last month. Um, but when in France, I also went out for a nice dinner with Maui on our own one time. Just the two of us. Launders was doing the HLTV Confirmed show. So Maui and I kind of hit the town, just us two. Went out for a beautiful dinner. Kicked it off with some langoustine. Now, I had never had langoustine. I have eaten mangosteen, which is a fruit. 
Well, langosteen is not anything comparable to that. No, langosteen is like a big old shrimp. And, um, you know, I thought like, okay, they'll like prepare it in some way. No, they do. They just boil them and then they refrigerate them and then they stick them on a plate in front of you. Ugh. This thing had eyes, bro. <laughs> this thing had eyes. It had claws. It had little tiny legs. Um, I think what was really cool to open the dinner, you know, that was actually one of my favorite like eating experiences during this event because I was super out of my comfort zone. You know, I don't eat a lot of shellfish, but I definitely don't eat it unprepared. Excuse me, unprepared like that. So, you know, I followed Maui's, uh, Maui's instructions. Again, shout out Maui. Uh, crack off the tail, break this, slice that, open these. I couldn't get into the claws or whatever. I made a nice little like, you know, I, I shredded three or four of them. Got all the flesh out, little garlic aioli, doused it in some lemon, made like a nice little like langoustine salad, like two spoonfuls, you know. But when you started, you know, when we started a meal like that, which got into some amazing dishes afterwards. But when you start off a meal with your hands and you're cracking stuff and there's juices flying and eyeballs popping, it's like you look down at the mess you've made and you're like, fuck, bro, it takes a lot of effort. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to prepare food. You know, when you're just on the receiving end of, of restaurants, a lot of the, you know, I, I, I cook, but I ain't crushing langosteens. I'll tell you that not on the daily anyways. And, uh, yeah, just kind of like me, you know, connects you to your food a little bit more. So that was cool. I'm glad that that was like an opening dish before we got into some really other, other good stuff, but uh, enough of all that. Okay. Paris, great city. These are the reasons I wanted to say that also the French. Just the French and the fact they speak French. Obviously, I speak French, but I speak French Canadian, uh, which doesn't function in the same ways. You know, it's very comparable, but anybody in Paris is going to pick out my accent in a heartbeat. And I remember on the first evening there, we go out to like a nice little beer garden. I'm going to order some drinks. And uh, as I'm ordering, this guy just looks at me and goes in French. Yo, are you from Quebec? And I knew that my French had failed me. You know, I couldn't blend in. I found out on day one, I could not blend in. And I've been practicing my French ahead of this event. So I said, yeah, 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 I'm, com I'm from Quebec. And his follow-up was, well, your accent's really cute. Yes! Ugh, my last experience in France, my only other experience, I was in Tour, like some small town for a DreamHack event, and uh, a carny, no trash talk to carnies, but a French carny in Tour, while I was ordering beer and fries, told me my accent was shit. I had a shitty accent, and that's why she could tell I was from shitty Quebec. And I was like, damn, that's just fucking rude. <laughs> you know, like I, I tried to I tried to service. I tried to help you out by ordering in your language and you're going to talk shit. We could switch to English, bitch. And then let's see what's up. But here in Paris, everybody was really kind. And that gave me confidence at the start of the event to use my French, which I used all the time. Uh, for two weeks straight, I really didn't think I would outside of maybe a moment or two uh, of actual casting. So uh, I whipped out the French constantly. Probably more than I would if I was even here in Quebec, to be honest. Um, and I had multiple people tell me, ah, from Quebec, awesome. Like people were excited about that. So that was really nice. People from France were really nice. I definitely had some interactions where like, you know, French people didn't, you know, they didn't know I could speak French. So they just thought we were like one night I went out with Maui to a wine bar. And we were stood like at the table, we we're at the table right next to the door. And there was clearly like a group of like 15 people who all knew each other going in and out from the front of the place into the back room where their stuff and their table was, you know, they're just like floating around the bar. And like, I don't know when I'm in a, when I'm in a foreign city, it's nice to go into places like that and like try to strike up conversations with strangers and, you know, when you are the other, as we are, you know, usually local people are kind of interested, like, yo, where are you from? What brings you here? You know, these are conversations that are usually very easy to strike up, um, you know, and then you go your separate ways. But 
in this one bar, dude, I had never felt so ignored, like purposely ignored. You know, we showed up and we were speaking English and we were doing it kind of loudly. So they very quickly assessed that, you know, we weren't from Paris. Um, and and I'm, they assumed that neither of us probably spoke French. And every time people would like come in and out, you know, you kind of, I would like lean out a little, like try to make eye contact, just, just to get like an opening to a social interaction. You know, we're all in a very tiny little room drinking wine together. Why can't we, why can't we strike up a little convo? It's not about us, but it's just friendly, you know? And every single time, man, you wouldn't even, you know, you know, it makes sometimes like you get like accidental eye contact and then you look away. Because you're not going to strike up a conversation. I was looking for just that. I just needed a human being in that room to recognize that I even existed. You didn't have to say a word. Just a glimpse. A glare. I would have taken... I would. You could have spat on me and it would have felt nice. Because at least then I knew my existence was recognized. But dude, those people ignored us so hard. To the point that we started openly talking about it and laughing about it. And like trying harder to get engaged with that but nah dude they weren't having anything to do with us but that was a, a rare occurrence that was a one-off in Paris most of the time people were very friendly when when we'd be like late night at the crepe spots everybody was talking um I think my French definitely helped you know there were some times I would break off into a French conversation so maybe my experience is different than some of the other broadcast talent but all in all Paris was a beautiful city visually easy to get around your public transport was great. The uh, the underground was phenomenal. Food, amazing. S tier. French people, friendly. French, just a beautiful language to be around. You know, sometimes I'm in Denmark and I hear a lot of and it's just like, ah. Ugh. Gives you the creeps. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, but French is something I reckon, you know, it's just nice to be around French. It sounds pretty. So... Paris, the city, 10 on 10. Very nice. Definitely helped our hotel was next to a rock climbing gym. I'll, I'll say that much. Uh, three minutes away, you know, that that was just, the, I mean, that, that we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this when we get to grand final Sunday. But that rock climbing gym was a savior to the experience in Paris. What's up, gang? This coffee's going down real smooth. You know, I tried to start this podcast yesterday, actually. I originally wanted to do it when I first finished up in Paris and got to London. But then I was like, damn, dude, I don't want to just get on a microphone right away. And it would have been like my lesser quality mic. And I did, you know, I was just like, I, I've been really reflecting for the last week. That, that, that grand finals was really something special. All of Paris was special for me, so... I didn't want to rush this podcast, but the longer it went on, the harder it was to start for some reason. And then yesterday I tried starting in the morning and I just didn't know like what my angle was. Didn't know what I wanted to talk about first. Um, there's a pretty big, pretty big, uh, reflection on just the day of the finals and kind of leading into it that, that was, I had to chew through first, you know, I had to, I had to really figure out because. It's been heavy in a good way. You know, it's a, it's a big deal. I've realized. I realized it was a big deal what went down in Paris. So we'll get to that. But Ah, okay. So did Blast put on a good major? Yeah, heavy question, huh? Um, this is, this is a subject I'm going to have to tiptoe around. Got to play the political game here. Obviously, you can't be biting the hand that feeds you. And overall, I'm satisfied with Blast's Major. But I think that I knew better than anybody or, or better than most that, you know, from the inside of Blast, Blast has always been a very small company, right? You, you essentially know everybody that's working on the Blast product. You contrast that to ESL, who runs studios all around the world, I mean, ESL is a massive company in comparison. And so I was always worried. When Blast announced its major, obviously I was excited. I thought that there was people at Blast who deserved to do a major, right? They had they had put in a lot of work uh, to make Blast Premier the product that it was and to make Blast considered, a, you know, what it was. 
what it is. But I knew there were going to be growing pains. Because to take on something like a major, wow, it's a huge undertaking. And it's an undertaking that I knew from the beginning that Blast didn't really have the facilities for. I think we saw that with the RMRs. So previously, obviously, PGL ran their majors, or excuse me, their RMRs out of their studios in Bucharest, which meant NA teams had to go to Europe, Asian teams had to go to Europe, EU teams in Europe. But nobody was really that upset about it back then that you would do a minor outside of your region. It was only when ESL and Rio happened that there was kind of this like uptick in the community conversation around NARMR should be in the Americas. Same for Asia, same for Europe. And I think that shift kind of screwed Blast a little bit because PGL ran their stuff out of Romania and it really wasn't a point of criticism. And obviously when you're running your RMRs out of your own event or your own studios, I mean, that is where you are least likely to have any kind of mistake or shortcoming, right? That is your own backyard. And PGL ran it in their backyard, ran it smoothly. And, and I like the fact that when, when you run all the RMRs in the same location, you actually get a standardized product. Right? It's a standardized experience for all competitors. It's the same PCs in the same room and they stay in the same hotel. It's the same for everybody. It's an even playing field throughout all three regions. ESL did it their way where they sent the America's teams to Stockholm. They did the European ones out of Malta, I think. And... When we had that conversation about, well, every RMR should be done in its own region, where does that leave Blast? Because I am 100% certain that Blast would have loved to have run all three regions out of their studio in Copenhagen as they did the European RMR. And if they had done that, they would have avoided some of the criticisms that they got from the start of all this cycle where, you know, I was in Monterey. We canceled half of the first day and pushed it to the day next. You know, we were delayed hours of a start. Uh, there were no ace zone sound canceling headsets for the players or the coaches, coaches team speak. You know, I, I don't need to sit here and reiterate all of the weird things that went down at the Monterey and Mongolian RMRs. Uh, Ulan Batar was a shit show. Um, you know, the motto in Monterey was essentially, at least we're not in Mongolia. And the European RMRs, they, there was a lot of work because the EU RMRs had the most amount of teams. So the broadcast talent definitely got stretched thin. And in that regard, our lives were pretty comfortable in Monterey. Plus, we got to go to Mexico. That was a bonus. But I chose where we went. You know, I signed up for that because I figured EU was going to be a lot more work. And I thought Monterey would be a nicer place to go. I was right. So... Right from the start, you know, these are examples of growing pains. Blast didn't have the facilities to run all of their RMRs from any studio they own. So they, they leased this out to Ace Liga for NA. And um, sorry, I don't know the I don't know the Asian partner, but whoever it was in uh, Mongolia. And by doing so, they opened themselves up to just start the whole cycle rough, you know. Um, those RMRs did not go smoothly. There were competitive integrity issues. Uh, there were, the settings were wrong. Uh, the, the amount of overtime money in the RMRs was not to the valve standard. Um, and so RMR overtime rules were actually different than the major overtime rules. And we didn't catch that until we got to Paris. And again, I'm happy with what Blast pulled off. You know, I know from the inside what went down here, right? But I also think it would be unjustified to not talk about some of the shortcomings of the event. And uh, I know others aren't going to say stuff because maybe they're less established with Blast. But, you know, I hold Blast to a high standard. I've been working for this company for four, four years. I know what they're capable of. I know what they've done in the past. And um, and I just, I just want to say that, you know, this was a huge, 
huge risk for them to take on. And I think that for the most part, they did a great job. But that to me was the number one example of them kind of like biting off more than they could chew. Now, had that conversation not happened and all the events go down in Copenhagen, RMRs would have gone off without a hitch. So there's that. Just unlucky timing for Blast. <clears throat> we get to Paris, all right? We get to Paris, we go to the Challenger stage. I think that when I first saw the Challenger set up... Um, it reminded me a lot of like Katowice 2023. Do you guys remember the Hall of Heroes? It's like all the setups face to face in that one long hallway, analyst desk in the front. It was very comparable to Kato 23, but I would just say like a budgeted version. And I think that budget is also something that Blast was constrained by throughout this event or it's 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 something that definitely had impact on some decision making. Uh, that original Challenger setup I think it served its purpose well enough. It was fine. It would have been cooler to have some of the bells and whistles that we've seen in the past. Like, the teams weren't playing face-to-face, -face, right? They were staggered. So they were playing on the same side of the room. Picture looking down a hallway, four teams on the left, four teams on the right. The first team closest to you on the left would play the third team closest to you on the left. So there was a, you know, a setup in between, but they weren't facing each other. They were facing the same direction. And just kind of, you know, 40 feet from one another. If you go back to Hall of Heroes and you go back to like the Blast Studio setup in Copenhagen. When they do Blast Premier Group Stage. Uh, we have that like uh, OPAC glass, right? That during live rounds <laughs> goes gray. During the end of rounds where people can stand up and talk shit. <laughs> shit goes clear. I love that. I love that setup. I like the players looking at each other. I like to see that. That emotion, that pop off, and we had some pretty hype games in the Challengers and and, and Legend stage uh, that would have merited that kind of a setup. Um, so you know there was that. There was also uh, there could have been a really cool spider cam. Uh, ESL had that spider camera that would like just hang over all of the players' setups in that whole room. It could go anywhere above them in the room, just like a top-down perspective of the players. Blast had those really nice camera angles that were like over the players' shoulders where you could see their screens. That I loved. And uh, yeah, that was a nice that was a nice little added. That's one thing they added to the broadcast. One of the few, you know, innovations Blast kind of went for. And even then, it's not a total innovation. It's something that they pulled out at Premier earlier this year. But it's just, it was a nice addition to their broadcast. Was getting to see it from players' screens with their mouse and keyboard all in shot. Very nice there. So, some pluses, some negatives. Some, again, just like extras that oh, would have just would have just taken it to a different level. You know? Just these little tiny extras. These little details. I think those are the kinds of things that were missing with Blast's Major. They were missing the polish on some of the setups. Like, uh, you know, personally, I really did not enjoy having to do B stream. I, I, I never saw anybody talk about this, but like Blast got away with a B stream that had two casters on it. That's it. Like, what? And And it wasn't just two casters that were given... You know, it'd be one thing if it's just like, okay, here's 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 the situation I present to you. If you decide to hire two casters for a B stream, fine, that's your decision. But the responsibilities of those casters should be to come on camera five minutes before the game goes live. Max. Cast the games, and when the game is over, you throw to a break. And I will come back when the next map is ready to go five minutes before again because you made the decision to only hire casters but when casters as they had to in blast paris major on that b stream we had a maximum three minute break maximum three minute break for a day where you have to cast two best of threes that's, that could be up to six maps. That could be up to eight hours. And your longest break ever is three minutes. Because the formula there would be pregame, cast, post-map analysis for a couple of minutes without going to a break. Then you throw to a three-minute break. Then you come back. You do a pregame segment for map two. Throw to a break. 
come back and cast that map. Like the fact that we're doing two segments in between maps as casters is wrong. You made the decision not to hire analysts and therefore your B stream does not get analysis. I think that's how it should be. Or you do what they had in Rio. You hire a full second set. Rio had a desk and analysts and an interviewer and caster. It was a fully flushed B stream, right? The B stream was as many people as the A stream. And I know for a fact that Blast, that was their original plan, that, that the, people, the people in charge of you know, creating the package, creating the broadcast, I know that that was their plan and, and that they fought for it to be like that. So that A stream and B stream was the same quality, was the same amount of importance. Because when you're at a major, in my opinion, A stream and B, it's all important. You know, having, there were moments where like we were on A stream thinking like, damn, I kind of want to watch that B stream game more than anything. You know, at a major, every match feels that much more important. So from a broadcast standpoint, I wish that they were. And that's my biggest criticism of Blast's Challengers and Legends setup was that B stream was very understaffed. Um, and that just kind of made like, you know, that made those like, don't you wish Fnatic and G2 eliminate, don't you wish G2 eliminated from the major had a proper post-match analysis? You know, thank God I cast with Launders. Launders can be an analyst. And so he carried us through those segments. That's, that's where he shows some of his, he shows his value. Uh, thank God, you know, he saves me. I, I'm not comfortable doing analysis. I can't break down a map, especially like having just cast it because the worst part, this is the worst. And I know somebody's going to be like, ah, work harder, work longer. It's like but the whole formula for commentary is that any point that I have to make about what I've just seen, you know, why did this team lose or why was this a stomp, etc.? We're going to have talked about that throughout the entire cast. Any point, any point that I could make about a match post game, I've made it during the game. That's my job. My job is to make all of my points during the live element of the broadcast. So afterwards, what am I expected to add? I haven't even had three minutes to think about, you know, what what more could I think about when you have to spend that three minutes quickly running to the bathroom, grabbing another bottle of water, and if you're lucky, getting a you know piece of food in, eating half a piece of bread. Yeah, it's a major, man. It uh, it deserved more in that regard. So, outside of that, I thought the Challengers and Legend stage was pretty sick. It was smooth as fuck. Very few tech delays, and I would say less tech delays than less tech delays than any major I can remember. From that reg from that regard. Mm, Blast absolutely nailed it. But, you know, at the end of the day, what's more important? That's a conversation that I think should be had. What is more important? Just getting through an event with no hiccups? Or going above and beyond for the last CSGO major? And I would also like to add this to the conversation. Since we're here, since I'm, all, I'm getting riled up now, okay? There's a lot of positive stuff to come to. I, I don't know. I hope I haven't been overly negative. I just I always just want the best for Blast. I know what they're capable of. So, um, I don't think Blast knew when they bid for this major that it would be the last CSGO major. You know, that comes with a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility that the community has just fabricated and put on you, right? Like, if you're a tournament organizer... It's I think I think it's a it's a blessing and a curse, right? You know that you sh you're gonna get these extra narratives. Vitality in France to win the last, you know, we tapped into that and Blast benefited from that despite not having to do anything themselves, right? That was just done for them by us, by the players, by the community, by the broadcast talent. So they got that. But you also have this extra pressure of like, well, this is the last one. And I think their trophy took a, you know, their trophy was the, was the, the victim of that element of criticism. Like this is the trophy for the last CSGO major. And, and a lot of people are upset about that. 
rightfully so. Um, but do you think that that trophy was designed before or after they knew this was the last event? You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So it comes with it comes with criticisms, but it comes with strengths. It's just I wonder if they knew what they were signing up for. Enough waffling, though. All right, I think I filled this episode with enough fluff to uh, to get into what I really want to talk about the most. So, I cast a CS:GO major grand final. Seven years and one month from posting a video of me casting my own knife round in ESEA. Seven years and one month between that and a CSGO major grand final. Now, uh, you know, I've, I've commentated amazing Counter-Strike in excellent venues. Uh, the Royal Arena, that's my house. The Antwerp major, the Rio major. I've cast big games. I've cast big moments. You know, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with the career I've had, but there was always that like, you know, that elusive, nearly impossible to obtain kind of goal, right? When I started casting seven years ago, the goal was to just cast Counter-Strike. I would cast whatever CS came my way whenever I got the chance to do it. I dropped out of university. I broke up with my girlfriend or rather she broke up with me. I moved back home with my parents. I couldn't afford rent. I wasn't making money, but I was casting Counter-Strike. That's all that mattered. I had something that was an outlet of creative expression and a source of purpose. That's what Counter-Strike has always been for me. It's what it was when I started, and it's what it, I want it to always be. It is a source of purpose and a way for me to entertain. It's a way for me to be a part of something bigger than just me. And at the same time, I love it because it's not about me. The pressure is not as much on me as it is the players. I'm not the center of attention. I'm just, I'm just a guy who gets to do his thing and, and hopefully add to the viewer experience. You know, I remember being sat at home, losing my mind, watching Counter-Strike games before I was ever a caster. And just, just thinking like, am I the only person who cares this much? And after seven years of casting, I can say, nah, I've met a lot of people who care as much as I do, as much as we do. And it's for that reason that I hope to add to that, you know, but seven years ago, that was the goal. And, and, you know, seven years is a long time. Um, your friends, your family, it all changes. Uh, think about your life seven years ago. Think about who you were seven years ago. When I do that, I was a completely different person, but I, I've still had a set goal that whole time. The one constant really is Counter-Strike because I dedicated myself to it. I dedicated my life to just pursuing this dream of casting Counter-Strike for a living. And you can cast Counter-Strike for a living and never touch a major grand final. There are great commentators who never got that chance. And even the greatest commentators that have been in CSGO don't get that chance very often. You know, James Bardolph and DDK cast two major grand finals. I have now cast one. If those legends only got a couple, then I know that this could be my only moment on a major grand final or one of the half of my moments, right? And that just, that just blows my fucking mind when I take a step back and compare my experience last week to these people who I, who 
who I witnessed before I occupied this space. And, you know, these guys are legends, man. Anders, Moses, Semler, Sato, Henry. Machine, Sponge, Bardolf, DDK, Scrawny and Launders. We're on that list now. And nobody can ever take that from me. You know, uh, it's it's not something I ever thought could really be possible because when you get into commentary and when, when, you know, back then I thought, okay, well, maybe I can carve out a space beneath all of these guys. You just want your piece of the pie, right? I, I don't need to be considered one of the best of all times to be happy with myself and with my contributions to this space. My happiness comes from the fact that I get to focus on Counter-Strike for a living. I get to travel the world. I earn good money. I am happy. I am satisfied. Being able to tick off that box, it almost feels like an unobtainable goal because there's all these other amazing commentators around us. Counter-Strike is stacked. And so, you know, would it have ever happened without Blast? I would like to think so. Yes. You know, I, I know my value. I know my worth. I know my ability. It makes the most sense that we cast a Blast Major Grand Final. Obviously, they've given us our biggest opportunities over the last few years. It only makes sense. I don't think everybody... Nobody should have been too surprised with me and Mohan being there, especially after we did one quarter final, no semifinal. You know, people start to figure it out. So, yeah, man, we did it. We did it. And and the day of, fuck, most intense day of my life in terms of broadcast. Um, I'm not a very anxious person when it comes to broadcast. I am, however, a bit of an overthinker. You know, I don't like being caught off guard. I don't like being unprepared for a potential situation. So I'll think about a lot of what could be situations ahead of time to, you know, kind of have a course of action already put in place. I don't get caught off guard. That's that's kind of that's usually my thing. But I wouldn't say I'm anxious. I overthink a little bit, but I'm always pretty in control of my my reactions and my emotions and 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 it's not it's never very anxiety really but when i woke up on the morning of the grand finals i remember lying in bed of the hotel room staring at the ceiling like wide eye and just i couldn't stop thinking about what was to come that day cuz you know we had to be there for like 4 p.m. it was like 9:30 in the morning and that that period of time between the morning and the game starting was a fucking roller coaster, a psychological roller coaster. And I want to run you guys through it just so you kind of know what my headspace was going into and coming out of a major grand final. Because it's a pretty short list of people who have ever been in that situation. So I wake up super anxious. And I know how to fix anxiety right off. I know that sitting in that hotel room and thinking is just going to get, you know, it's going to make it worse. I got to get up. I got to get out. And this is where we come back to the rock climbing gym. You know, uh, the last six months of my life, I've been bouldering more than I've just been going to the regular gym. It, it has been a real source of happiness for me. And, uh, there's also that social element that makes it even better. You know, you could put on your headphones and go hit the treadmill. That does that does help me too. But nothing helps quite as much as being surrounded by your buddies, laughing, talking, and also overcoming, you know, physical challenges in bouldering. So I just I got up and left, man, instantly. I just got up, put on my clothes, left. I messaged Mohan. I said, yo, Mo, I'm going to the rock climbing gym. You know, we expected to go together, but he was we were going to go later. He was out on a bike ride. I just said, I'm going now. I got to get out of the room. I'm heading over. And I got into the junk climbing gym, got a coffee, started climbing on my own. You know, and all this time, these thoughts are still just with me. I can't stop thinking about the casting that was going to come up later that day. 
and man it was affecting my climbing like i had never been kind of, i've never really been that anxious before thinking about broadcast you know and then launder shows up and joey shows up and and there were there were there were climbs that i had done multiple times throughout the week that I couldn't, I couldn't get past like the halfway point in them. I was just thinking like, man, if I fucking fall, if I hurt myself, I won't be able to cast it. Like all these intrusive thoughts. Usually once I start a physical activity, everything else is just kind of background noise because that's the distraction, right? That's the beauty of exercise. It's the, it's the ultimate distraction. You're focused on the present. And I couldn't get into that headspace. Um, so much so that after like, you know, and now it's compiling. Like now I didn't have the confidence to really, if I had to cast in that moment, I would have sucked. I would have, I wouldn't have had the words. And then now I can't even climb because those same thoughts are like holding back. Whoa, man, you can't climb today. Like what's wrong? You know, everything just felt off. And I remember at, at a point, bro, Launders looks over at me and he just goes, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you? Get out of your head. Come on, man. You know, come on said the endorphins are at the top of the wall, bro. Go get them. And Mohan had no clue. He had no clue how difficult of a morning I was having. I didn't say anything to anybody there. I was I was having my own battle in my own head. But that is the that is the benefit of commentating with one of your best friends. I've been doing this job for 7 years. I've been doing it with Mohan for essentially 6. And it takes a real friend to just push you like that, to just know something's up. And, you know, I would like to believe he had an intuition that I wasn't really having my best morning. And he knew as much as I knew what was going to be asked of us that day. And he got me out of that fucking headspace. Because once he said that to me, it's like it clicked in my head as if like, no, you're right. I do have to overcome this challenge now or else I'm going to fail the challenge later today. So I started climbing harder and I got to the top of the wall and I got those endorphins and I was fucking pumped. And if it wasn't for launders on that morning, I don't know what level of confidence I would have walked into the venue with. But I walked out of that rock climbing gym fired up. I'm grateful that I get to cast with Mohan because for six years he has pushed me to be a better person, to be a better commentator, to be a professional. You know, he's the closest thing I've ever had to a bigger brother. He's just that, just a few years older than me, you know, just a few years wiser. And I have my own strengths and I cover his ass when it comes to his weaknesses, you know, in and out of the server. I think we, we, we're different we're just different enough with an, with some commonality and uh you know i always laugh when i see people like talk shit about mohan and his commentary cuz mohan has to work harder than any other caster mohan is the least naturally talented caster in this space but i know he is one of the hardest working casters in this space because he has to make up for the fact that he doesn't have the natural skill set to really occupy his position. But he's fucking earned it. And he's earned it more than a lot of other people. And on top of that, without him, I am not myself. I am a shell of a commentator without Mohan. Without him in that morning, without him in that moment recognizing I needed to be pushed. I was not having a good day and some people would have just been, you know sensitive and soft with me but mo's gonna fucking shove me in the right direction two hand push go bitch and i love that i needed that i leave the rock climbing gym i go back to the hotel i get back into my hotel room like i said i am fired up for the next like we had like two hours before we had to go in at that point for those two hours i've got a playlist of my favorite songs going 
I'm fucking pacing the room back and forth as I'm getting ready, looking in the mirror, practicing my intro, practicing my big lines, going back over my preparation. You know, when I was in the gym, I remember literally thinking, I remember these exact words coming through my brain so clearly I could almost see them. I just thought, what if you're not good enough today? And I had never had that much self-doubt when it came to broadcast before. And I just chalk it up to just the extra added pressure of a major grand final. It is the biggest challenge, the biggest ask. It it is the biggest moment that a commentator can really have in their career. And, and, you know, me and Mo, we had told ourselves going into the event, it's just another grand finals. We've cast grand finals to packed out stadiums. We've cast major games in big stadiums, we've done it all. But in reality, we hadn't. A major grand final feels very different on the day of. I have learned that. And I got over that. And when I got back to that room, dude, I was pumped. I'm fucking practicing my lines in the mirror. I'm crying. I keep like crying tears of joy because now I know my brain has gotten over the hump. Now I'm fired up, dude. And I just can't wait to get into that arena and take over the show. And because I I was prepared, you know, I was so prepared for that. I had written my intro days in advance. I had practiced it. I knew when I was going to drop it. We get to the venue. I'm just in the flow state now, right? It's, It's crazy how you can start a day feeling so bad and then hours later be having the fucking time of your life you know i walked into that place i was fucking suited dude fresh suit waistcoat new shoes looking good feeling great walk into the green room and there's just this there's just this vibe right everybody knows what you're about to kind of take on what's about to go down And I have to say, man, I'm blessed to work with the people that I do because we walked into that green room and every single person hyped us up. Every other person on the talent team that I saw prior to the grand finals looked me in the eyes and said, you're going to fucking kill this. Get out there. Smash it. Give it your all. We get up to the computer on the desk. I find a note written next to the, you know, GOTV IP from machine. Previous major final commentator three times over his message you're gonna fucking kill this this is your moment as much as it is theirs to have somebody like him supporting us in our most pressured moment makes you feel invincible i mean how can you fail when that is your support you can't Underneath it, message from Anders Bloom, voice of CSGO. A man who has been here for a decade, has cast the first major to the last major and nearly everyone in between. Same thing. You boys got this. Bro, now I'm on cloud nine. Now I'm entered in the flow state. You know, now the now the player intros are happening. Me and Mo now I'm vibrating. I'm vibrating with fucking energy. And that is a feeling I will chase for the rest of my life. That is why I do this now. You know, uh, not all commentary moments are that fucking glorious. Sometimes it's a showdown. It's two in the morning. You're casting NACS and it's all online. And that's a different part of this game, baby. You know, that's, 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 that comes with the territory. But it's all worth being able to step up to that stage, put on that headset, and cast glorious moments of counter-strike history that's why i do this and even if it only happens once or twice a year even if it's only a fall finals and and some kind of a major playoff it's it doesn't have to be grand finals but those big stages packed full of people dude that is a drug that is so incomparable to any other headspace that my life puts me in. And, and personally, I feel like I thrive in that dude. It's I've you're you're never as present in your life as you are when you're casting in those moments, because you look up and you see 10,000 human beings 
all engaged with the exact same thing you're watching, except they hear what you're saying. You know, that pressure. Ooh, I fucking love it. And I haven't stopped thinking about it since I was there a week ago. And, you know, it wasn't a perfect grand finals. In terms of grand finals, it was quite a blowout. 16-6, 16-13, and that 16-13 is a, you know, CT-sided nuke half that gave Gamer Legion a 10-5 edge. Everybody kind of saw that one coming back in the second half, and sure enough, it happened. Now, of course, I don't need it to be competitive. I really don't. You know, sometimes I've been disappointed with major matches in the past. My Navi Ents semifinal in Antwerp, that one didn't give me the didn't give me the dopamine uh, that something like this would have. And I think that that comes down to the undeniable fact that I cast a CS:GO major grand final, and I'm going to cherish that for the rest of my life. Could have been a bigger blowout. I wouldn't have given a fuck. Because because that moment, as much as it's not about me, that moment's mine. And if I do say so, you know, here's the thing with commentary, right? Here's my advice to any caster who's trying to aspire to be in this position one day. You cannot control the games you get. Sometimes it's going to be a flop. You can't get upset at that. You know, I had more lines prepared for players that never really... Po- we didn't... You know, in terms of in terms of biggest moments, if you think about the biggest moments of that series, not even, not even the fact that the game was not competitive, but even within that blowout, the biggest moments, Apex 1v2 clutch top connector on overpass where he essentially misses half a magazine and then they get into a pistol fight. You know, that was like... That got you on the edge of your seat for all the wrong reasons. It was that, and it was Shuhei getting a double Desert Eagle kill from long A overpass into A site in a two versus four that Gamer Legion won. One of six rounds in that map. Those are the biggest moments. There was no Zywu 1v4. There was no crazy Sphinx clip. You know, I'm sat there waiting for these kinds of things to happen so that I can drop my big casting. You know, it's like, obviously, there's shit I'm ready for. That's the whole thing. That's my whole angle with commentary. Be ready for things before they happen. But if you get a game that where, where those moments don't happen, you can't get upset about that. Is what it is. Try again next time. However, I will say that you can be prepared for the two things you know will happen every single time. And this is where I think this is where I think I was glowing. You will always have a map one introduction in a packed stadium full of people who are frothing at the mouth to get a grand final started. That introduction is a golden opportunity to create a core memory for people watching. Now, it's less so on quarterfinals and semis as it is grand finals, right? Of all those introductions, you can go your hardest on a grand final because it's the last match of the major. Everybody's tuning in for that start time in person, online. You know all eyes are on for that first round to happen. And I knock that shit out of the park. You know, I remember my my Royal Arena heroic Astralis intro where I said, Copenhagen, can you let me hear you roar? And that was, I thought, going to forever be like my best introduction. I was like, I, how do I top that? You know, and that was months in preparation. I had been to the venue with it completely empty and used that same line in order to, you know, for the documentary trailer, the ready up, the blast made. And I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to top it. I really didn't. But I think the Paris one was better. Sprinkle in a little French. Get the crowd on your side. <laughs> um, and I've talked to people who who said that was fucking awesome. And, and I'm glad that they appreciated the effort you put into that. Because, you know, you're taking a risk. If that moment flops, hmm. But see, and here's my take. My take is that moment will never flop 
if you give it your everything. You can't half-ass that. You know, you, you can't you can't start a little speech like that and then only go 60%. You've got to put a hundred into that. And if you trust yourself and if you trust the crowd to respond back when you do that, you will get what you are looking for and you will create that moment where everybody is now on the edge of their seats because the gladiators are about to walk out. And also, bless Martin. Bless Martin our producer at blast because we prepared that moment i knew the timings to an exact t if you go and watch back that introduction the only thing i had to ad lib launders had his line prepared and then when he finished we were supposed to turn around because i didn't want to do that hype facing the camera i wanted to do that hype facing the crowd and when we go off camera pre-game that is when we can turn around face our pcs and face the crowd and and there was a little delay there so I ad lib this whole, uh, and Gamer Legion are a formidable foe. But the camera turned off, and then I switched into the intro mode, and I, and I nailed it. And you can always have that moment, regardless of the quality or the competitiveness of the Counter-Strike. You know, I said at the start of this episode, or earlier, that I don't like to be caught off guard. I'm not an anxious person. But I do overthink things, and I overthought that introduction perfectly. You know, those are those things you can prepare ahead of time. And my, you know, my opinion is if you're not preparing those moments, and if you're not putting that extra effort into them, you're missing out on a chance at, at doing this job that much better. The other side of it, and this is where we got to get back into the negatives about Blast for a second, because... You know, it just sucks. It just sucks that this moment kind of got scuffed. Um, and I don't think people have really talked about it, but the post-map, man, the post-match, when, when Vitality win, I can, I can, this is just my honest take, and it, this is not even about Blast. Doing interviews before the trophy lift is a horrible idea. I hate it. You know, and, and I'm not sure what the angle is. I've heard people argue like, oh, but you get their you get the purest emotions because they've just won. But my opinion is those emotions don't kick in until they've gone and lifted their trophy. Once they've lifted a trophy, then the win truly sinks in. Look at the pictures of players winning. Look at Katowice 2023 when Nico, for the only time in his career, cried on camera. It's once he lifted his trophy. That is when the emotions kick in. So interviewing them before the trophy lift, A, interrupts a moment that's not about you. And when I say you, I mean the TO, right? The TO wants to get the product. They want to get that interview. They want to get the clip. They want to get the moment. They want to capture it for themselves, for their broadcast. But once the player has won the event, it's about them. That is their moment to go and lift a trophy. They earned their win. They've been fighting and preparing for months. And they finally get their moment. And you're going to slow that down for the sake of an interview to try and get some kind of soundbite? Come on. I hate the idea of doing interviews before the trophy lift. And I think we saw that at Blast. That it didn't go well. Uh, it slowed everything down. And... To be fair, I think the second reason that that happened is I heard through production that uh, the Blast stage setup didn't allow for interviews in the center of the room. The way that the speakers were set up and, and the microphone, something about they couldn't do the interviews from the center stage, so they had to do it front stage. And they didn't want the players to go do a trophy lift, then come back to the PCs, and then interview there. So they decided to do it beforehand. Now, when I got to the venue on the day of the grand finals... First of all, we were only briefed that those interviews were happening pre-trophy 30 minutes before Grand Finals started. And 30 minutes before Grand Finals started, the original plan was that I wrap up the game when they win, I fill until James Banks is ready with interview, James Banks does the interviews, and then James does the trophy lift. Now, James does not want to do that trophy lift straight up. When we found out, it was me, Mohan, and James. We were all told at the same time side by side. And James's immediate reaction was, no way. I am not meant to do trophy lifts. That is a commentator's job. Commentators do it. You know, he knows, his, he knows all of our strengths. And he realizes that's the caster's moment, right? Like, that's, always, that's how it's always been. It's how it should be. Um, 
And so we, we tried to find a way, a solution, and, and our solution was meant to be this. Map ends. We hype. Give to James. Interviews occur. James tells them to go lift the trophy. Casters come back in. And then casters hype from the moment players leave the stage until they lift the trophy. Now, that gives me 15 seconds. In 15 seconds, I can give you a magical line. In 15 seconds, I could give you something on the same level as that introduction. But unfortunately, and I think this is what happens when you make plans last minute, 30 minutes, in fact, before the grand final started. When James sent the players down for the trophy, my mic didn't get opened. If you watch back that moment, you'll see that for 8, 9, 10 seconds, there's just nobody talking. And it's just players walking to the trophy. And then when I come back in, you hear me mid-sentence. Millions around the world. Or, uh, no, it's signed by millions. Your Blast TV Paris Major Champions, Team Vitality. Now, you guys have been listening to Scrawn Dog, and you know that I take pride in the trophy lift moments, and that I think that you know that's some of my best contributions in 2022. And um, I felt like this one got really scuffed, man. I there was there was a bunch of there was a, there was two three sentences leading into that that kind of paid homage to Counter Strike Go finishing, to Vitality being the last five humans to win. A CSGO major, you know, it was, I'm not going to give you the lines, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to re retell it. Point was, it was fucking hype, man. It was better than it would have been. So I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit disappointed that the last trophy lift at a CSGO major got scuffed by, by something like that. And I just wonder like, you know, would it have happened if the stage setup was different? Would it have happened if, if from the get-go we had more communication and we didn't establish this kind of you know closing ceremony in that order if interviews were just after the trophy lift that wouldn't have happened like why did we try to do something different for this blast tv major when the formula for all of the premier events works so perfectly why did this one change why would we change it now you know so that to me was just like that was the only mistake that happened in the in the in the arena Everything other than that was amazing in the arena. And I have to say, the French crowd is fucking fantastic. World-class crowd. World-class. You know, booing Cadian and Heroic the moment they were on stage, but then going into the Cadian chants after he's been eliminated. Fantastic. It's, it's the type of, like, home field advantage that you want. They go crazy for Vitality. They went crazy for a guy like Kioz. You know? Poor kid has a really rough playoff stage, but still was a fan favorite. And there was respect for every team, all the teams, all the players. And then in elimination, right? Then you give Katie the respect he deserves. Because love him or hate him, as a player, he deserves your fucking respect. His career is amazing. And the French did that, you know? And... and, and it, the French kind of have a bad reputation, right? Kind of cold or whatever. But in that in that environment, amazing crowd. I hope I hope to God we go back to Paris. Um, phenomenal crowd. One of my favorite crowds ever. Um, they were not as big as the Antwerp crowd, which is still a legendary one as well. But I think the class and the culture that the the Paris crowd showed. Beautiful. So thank you to anybody who was there in person for, for making it that much better. And uh, obviously Vitality winning on home soil made made the major, right? All these crazy upsets, all these underdogs in the playoffs getting further than they're supposed to. But in the end, Vitality get their major in France. And, and I think that's better for the event as well, obviously. Like, you know, there was a time a night before where I was thinking, fuck, I might have to cast Gamer Legion versus Apex in a grand final. Like, what's the angle there? You know, from, from a storytelling perspective, uh, what do we, 
what's the angle? You know, what do we do there? I, I wasn't quite sure. So I was ready for Gamer Legion. I was ready for Shuhei. And, and you know, you could talk about the A-Core and, and Ema exploding into the scene, etc. With Gamer Legion, with, with one of the two teams, you know, if one of those two teams is in the finals versus a favorite, I think it's it's there's an angle. You can craft something there. It's the It's the idea that both teams being underdogs... You kind of lose your story, create your story, storytelling. So, I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Uh, not just as a Vitality fan, but just just for as a Counter Strike fan, I think it's a very beautiful way to kind of send off CS:GO. And uh, overall, yeah, man, I'm very happy. But I wanted to be a critic today as well. I feel like I'm never really negative on Scron Doggin, but I thought that with the scale of the major, you know, we want we want nothing but perfection when it comes to Counter-Strike Majors. And so here I am today to, to tell you what did indeed go wrong. But at the end of the day, you know, afterwards, I went to, uh, I went to London, right? Because I told myself, like, Sophie came out to, to witness this. To share that moment with Sophie was also very special. Um, this isn't something I really talked about publicly at the time, even though it's it was on the front of my mind, but... Uh, you know, I'm not a very like spiritual person or not a, I'm not a God fearing man, but I do believe sometimes life just has these like funny little coincidences, you know, these little coincidences that you can't quite shake. And I said that in seven years of commentary, so much has changed and so much has been different. And, and I feel like a completely different person and that counter-strike was my only, you know, constant. But that's not true. Uh, Sophie. Sophie and I celebrated our six-year anniversary on Grand Finals Sunday. Six years with Sophie, who has watched me go from commentating obscure online Mountain Dew League, you know, back before I was doing any international lands, essentially. Right? And the first time I ever met Sophie was when I came back from a LAN in Mountain Dew League back in... Back in what, 2017? Who knows, man? Long time ago now. But I came back from Europe after a Counter-Strike event, and I had been I had been talking to Sophie through text message for like a month, maybe. And for the first time I met her, it she met me at the airport. I came back from a Counter-Strike event, and she surprised me at the airport. She was waiting for me there. And we've been together ever since. And for me to celebrate the biggest moment of my, my commentary career on the same day as, you know, such a great milestone for us, that's just, isn't that crazy? What are the odds it's on the exact same day? You know, I can happily say that that was the best day of my life. And it didn't start out as the best day of my life, but it really turned into something spectacular. And that's why... A sketchy trophy lift and a non-competitive game of Counter-Strike don't affect me in the least bit. Usually I would feel, you know, some sense of disappointment and I would want it to live up to my expectations. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want a 16-14, 16-14 overtime finish, right? Of course. But I'm still so happy with how it all went down because it went down however it was meant to be. And, and I don't just apply that to the grand finals, but I apply it to kind of the last six, seven years of my life. It all went down how it was supposed to. By committing myself to Counter-Strike seven years ago, given a completely random chance when my YouTube video blew up and all I did was cast a fucking knife round, to waking up the next day to messages from the voice of Counter-Strike, Anders Bloom, to sacrificing so much for being gone throughout friends, weddings, anniversaries, Valentine's days, missing Christmases, birthdays, all these things that I have missed and been absent for due to the pursuit of Counter-Strike. Seven years and one month. That's how long it took me to go from nothing to a CSGO major grand final. 
and I have no clue how much longer I'm going to do this job and I have no clue what kind of opportunities I will have in the future. I don't know where or what I'll be doing one year, two years, five years from now in my life. But if the last seven years have taught me anything, it's to believe in yourself, to bet on yourself, and to just do what feels right. I can only hope that I will have more days like that grand final Sunday. I don't need them because I got mine. I got my moment and I have it forever captured on video. Thank you to Alex, AKA Crollabola, who is responsible for caster reaction videos. He sent me that video of Launders and I wrapping up the Paris major, the trophy lift, the hug, Mohan grabbing me by both my arms, looking me in the eye and screaming, we beat the game. And I was on the brink of tears from the end of that, that second map. And I cried and I kept crying and I couldn't stop because I had this overwhelming sense of accomplishment, you know, you don't have to have cast a major grand final to be a, an amazing CSGO commentator. I, I always knew that. And it's just, it's something special to be kind of etched into the history books like that. And I don't take it for granted. All right. I want people to realize that I understand how lucky I am to have had that moment, to have been given that moment. And I just hope that by giving it my everything, not just in that day, but over the last seven years, by giving this my everything, I hope that I have in some way, one way or another, made your experience better. Because if I can make someone's viewing experience better, then I've done my job. That's what I'm here for. To me, it is just about being a part of something that I fucking love and sharing that passion with people who love it as much as I do. And if I can, you know, be the person in the front of the pack to fucking lead that charge, you know, if, if you, if you guys need somebody to fucking hype so that our moments in Counter-Strike history are remembered, that's what I'm fucking here for. I get very emotional when I think about all this shit because seven years is a long time. It's a long time of traveling and being away from home and not knowing what comes next and having to, you know, exist within this space, but to do so with the people that I now call friends as much as I call colleagues. And I am proud of the people I work with that I spend all my time with. And I'm proud of myself too. Proud to be a part of Counter-Strike.